screen up there, it says Brown Bannister. It should also include King David. He wrote the words. <laughs> Psalm 51. Ah, scripture I'm going to use this morning is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 21. Something that I was reminded of between the worship services. Uh, we thought you'd say something about the Bible reading marathon. I went, whoops, you know. Uh, I should have, but I'll say it now with this group. We uh, did something that I think is really neat at Faith United Methodist Church. As a church, we read the Bible from cover to cover. It took us 10 days to do it. We set up a little podium and microphone, and a lot of people in this room helped and you participated. There was a lot of really neat things that happened. The, the way we ended, I thought, was really precious. There was a lot of people who came early and other folks read and stayed later. We had it set up that every 15 minutes would be somebody different reading. And we were kind of in the middle of the book of Revelation and I was looking around at all the people and I said, let's change the rules. Let's have us read one chapter at a time. And so that way we got more people involved reading. We came to the last chapter, chapter 22 of Revelation. We all gathered around the microphone and we read one verse at a time going around. And then when it came to the very last verse, everybody read the last verse in unison. And with that, we finished about six o'clock on Tuesday night. I never know how long it's gonna take. Uh, I guess in this case, it took us 78 hours, but I cheated. I came in on Monday morning because it looked like we were running behind the first Monday morning. And so I read for about 45 minutes to move it up a little bit. And I found that, that uh, Jeanette Watt was doing the food pantry on Wednesday, finished the food pantry at 1130. And so she read between 1130 and noon to kind of help catch up. And there were some other times that people read outside the, the area. I think I know that uh, Joanne, when she came in at night, wanted to read to the end of whatever book it was. Most nights, it was just a couple of extra pages. One night she was gonna do it with Jeremiah. And I said, before you do that, you may wanna look, we're gonna be here till 10 o'clock. <laughs> and so she said, yeah, I think you're right. We'll, we'll close a little earlier than Jeremiah. But, but we, we, uh, we did it and I'm really pleased. I think the Lord's working. One of the fruits of our labor is Kim. Because uh, because I put on our Facebook page, I put pictures of it and said, you know, come over here and read. And Kim hit that little like button. And so I looked her up and sent her a message. I said, come on over and read with us. And, and uh, she's, I think she might belong to the same club I do. It's a procrastinators club. <laughs> but I haven't made a meeting yet. And it was like Wednesday. And she said, hey, can I come over and read? I said, we can come over and read, but we, we're not reading anymore. We finished. She said, no. Oh. And so she was talking to, I guess, Jeanette or somebody. And they said, well, come over to our dinner Wednesday night. And she came over. We had a hymn sing Wednesday night and joined the choir. So we're glad to have him as part of it. And that's because of the Bible reading marathon indirectly, I think. It had a, had a little bit of stuff to do with it. And so I didn't want to bring that up that it was it was successful and it was good and and now we're just trusting the Lord to to give us the fruits of, of our proclaiming his word and we just wanted the, all the heavenly forces to know we stand on the word of God and that Jesus Christ is Lord and we trust the Lord will help us with that uh, God, God I'm happy with the good news with, with the, the we one coming and Alan and I talked it over and we thought Alan Roberts a really good name for that, for that boy. And so we're, we're going to do good. Uh, let me take the scripture and, and move along. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 21. This is just one verse of many I could have used. Uh, the Lord is speaking with Moses and Sinai in front of the burning bush. And one of the things that, Mo, that uh, Moses hears from the Lord it says, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to be your people. 
as your child, as brothers and sisters together in the church, and as we seek to live our lives molded and shaped by you and your spirit, we want to be people who say yes to your direction. And we want a heart that is wholly committed to you and your purposes. We do pray, as we join King David in Psalm 51, create in us a clean heart, O Lord. A heart that is clean and empowered with your love to accomplish your purposes. Help us to look at our heart today and, and what it means to have a heart that's useful for you. In Jesus' name. Over and over again, in the first part of the book of Exodus, it's written, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, God hardened his heart. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, God hardened his heart. In fact, it was, it was known all over the world that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And as a result of his hard heart, there was destruction amongst the people of Egypt. It's interesting that, that uh, sometime later, I guess maybe a couple hundred years later, the children of Israel are in the promised land, in the land of milk and honey. They were in war with the Philistines. This war went on and off for a long, long time. But the Philistines had a battle, and they won the battle. And the sons of Eli were killed in that battle. And one of the spoils of that battle was the Ark of the Covenant that was taken. And it was taken over to the Philistine temple and the Philistine gods were in there. And they put the Ark of the Covenant in there. As they, they, they were kind of, they were multi, um, worship many gods. And they said, well, that God will work. We'll put him in here. We've got this one and we got that one. We'll have our temple just filled with, with all these gods. And if we, I guess they figured if we got enough gods, we're sure to pick the right one. But they got up the next morning, interestingly enough, and all the other gods had fallen down before the Ark of the Covenant. They go, that's weird. Who got in here and did that? You know, they, they, they think it's a god, but the god can't move. You know, they even know that. So they picked it back up. Well, the next day, there was, there was a god called Dagon, D-A-G-O-N, and they went in there. And this time, Dagon had fallen down before the ark, and its hands and its feet and its head were all severed. It was just kind of laying there in pieces before the ark. They were also being cursed. That things were happening to the people, and they go, oh, this is awful. And, and, and somebody, a very wise leader of the Philistines said, this is my paraphrase, you can read it in, the, in 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6, but he basically said, you know, we've got to be cautious. We do not want to harden our hearts the way that Pharaoh hardened his heart and resulted in the total destruction of Egypt. We've got to do something, and, and what we're going to do, and what they did, they put the Ark of the Covenant on a wagon and put two cows in front of it and just turned it loose. And, they, and sure enough, these two cows went straight to where Eli was, or actually Eli died, it was Samuel. Where Samuel was, here it is, he called the Levites over and they put the, the Ark back in the tabernacle. But the significance, what I want to share with you, that story is the leaders of the Philistines says, we do not want to harden our hearts the way Pharaoh did. Too many people in our time failed to heed that advice. We harden our hearts. I, there's times in my life I get stubborn. I like to say I'm determined. But if you're going against the principles of God, that stubbornness, we want to be determined to follow the Lord regardless of what kind of pressures hit. <laughs> But uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're doing it the Lord's way. Okay. Now, we talk about um, a heart that's hardened. You ever wonder what that means? You ever wonder what it means for someone to have a hard heart? Um, 
in my own life, I'm inconsistent. One day I'll be in a better mood than I'm in other days. But on those days that aren't going so swift, I know that I'm kind of got a hard heart. What's going on here? Some days I'm easier to get along with than other days. Some days uh, my heart gets hard. And other times I'm kind of a pushover. Now at first glance, it looks like that God is going into Pharaoh's heart, making it hard. But bear with me here. Uh, is that really, really the case? Is it really the case that, that God has reached down into Pharaoh and made his heart hard? Is that really the case? Uh, let me give you a comparison here. Suppose, let's pretend it's a hot summer day. 95 degrees, sun bearing down on us. We're outside, no breeze. And suppose you've got a, a pan, and in one pan, somebody's made beautiful mud pies. Did you ever make mud pies when you were little? I guess young people today, they just do this all the time. And they don't have all the, they don't climb trees. I mean, I used to climb trees, ride a bicycle, make mud pies, and that sort of thing. I think nowadays, young people do, they don't do that. They get on the phone and they text me. But anyway, you know, but, but I take a pan full of, full of sloppy mud. Okay, I've got one pan here. I've got another pan full of frozen butter. And I set both of them out in the sun. What happens? The butter is going to melt. The mud is going to get hard. Same sun, same temperature, same conditions. The mud gets hard, the butter gets soft. I guess a good question is, is your heart made of mud or is your heart made of butter? I heard another story one time. I was, at a, I was at a conference. It was an outdoor kind of thing. And the speaker was talking about our hearts and what's in our hearts. And he had this cup. And he held out the cup. He got a volunteer from, from you know, a young man to come up, sit on the front row. He says, come up here. He got up here on stage. He said, now I want to tell you something. He said, there's water in this cup. See the water in the cup? Yeah, there's water in the cup. He said, I'm holding my hand out like this. Why don't you take my hand and you shake it. Shake it hard. I mean, really give it a go. And he really shook it. All of a sudden, water slopped out on everything. He said, why did water come out of that cup? And the guy said, because I shook your arm. He said, that's not why water came out of the cup. Water came out of the cup because water was in the cup. Now, I've done the same thing, a little kind of, only I use paper shavings because I've been sad and I don't want water to get all over everything. Why did paper shavings come out? Because I shook your arm. No, because water shavings were in there. What came out of your life the last time you got shook? Uh oh. I remember hearing a story from a, a college friend of mine that he was driving, or he wasn't driving, his father was driving, he was a passenger, and they were they were going down the road and all of a sudden the truck pulls over in front of them. And and my friend said, Oh boy. He said, he and his dad both shouted out. His dad said, help me, Lord Jesus. I won't tell you what my friend said. But it shows what can be in our life, what's in our heart. When you, last time you got shook, what came out? That gives you an idea of what's in your heart. That gets what in there. Okay. We need to do some self-examination. And self-examination takes courage. In the Alcoholics Anonymous program, there's the 12 steps of AA. And the fourth step is pretty important. The fourth step says, I have made a fearless, searching, moral inventory of my life. Think of your life. Now, I used to work as a consultant for a substance abuse unit, and people did their fourth step. They wrote it out a fearless moral inventory of their life. The fifth step is you go to a person and you basically read them what you've done on the fourth step. You tell them what, the, what your life looks like after this fearless searching moral inventory. And I would sit down, sometimes they were teenagers, 15 years old who were hooked on drugs and going through treatment. 
And they would write a hundred page book. This is what's going on in my life. This is this and this and this and the other. Wow. And then I'd get somebody that's in their 70s and they'd write a half a page. And I would say, that's not good enough. You did not do a fearless, searching, moral inventory of your life. They were just, and so I sent them back and the word got out. If, if I didn't approve of the fourth step, if I flunked them, they had to stay another week in treatment. <laughs> so people got in there and they really dug in and they said, here's where I made a mess of my life. And here's what I'm doing about it to try to turn it around. And uh, I think something like that would be good for us to do. You know? Do a fearless, searching, moral inventory. We're going to share communion together in a few minutes. And I think one of the most important parts of the communion process is to make sure that our hearts are right before the Lord. And I think a good thing to do before you take communion is you, you get before the Lord and you say, okay, how, where am I? Are we, are we, as some of the vernacular is, are we tight? Are we, are, am I, is my heart really right and pure before the Lord? Am I forgiven? Am I forgiven? Have I, have I searched my heart and I know that I'm forgiven? I know I'm really working with the Lord here. That's something really important to do. Is your heart such that when the Lord moves, we move with Him? Is our heart such that we allow Him to use us and to mold us for His glory? You might say, well, gee, my heart, I've got all kinds of things I've done wrong. Well, well that's good. You can just say, okay, Lord, I repent. I, 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 hand, this, I hand my heart to You and with all the, the awfulness and the ugliness and the sin and the mistakes, the things I know I should have done that I haven't done, the things I did that I shouldn't have done, and you let the Lord give it a good scrub and give it back to you. To, you can do that it takes five seconds. But it takes nothing. You know, as soon as you turn to the Lord, there's a country song way back a long, long time ago It says, if you take one step toward me, I'll run a mile to you. I thought, that's perfect, because you take one step towards Jesus, and he'll run a mile to you. And you say, well, I'm already coming to Jesus. I'm a Christian, and I'm still blowing it. Well, you still take one more step towards Jesus, and he'll run a mile to make it right. He'll do that, because he loves you. So we, we want our heart to be his. So often we, well, we'll give Jesus a part of our heart, but the other part of our heart belongs to the company I work for, or whatever the case might be. Make sure he has your whole heart, and as his love permeates and flows through your heart, you'll do a better job at work, you'll be a better father, mother, child, parent, wife, husband, everything. The Lord will do it. Repent, return, and then last week I talked about refreshment. That's when we really have refreshment. We repent of our sins, we return to the Lord, we know that we're right before him, because I think one of the necessary ingredients for communion, before we take that bread and before we take that cup, we know that we're right before the Lord. That's important. And then we come and we dine with Him. We, we feast with Jesus as one of His children, pure and holy in the sight of God. So, we're going to do communion a little different today. A lot of times, uh, most months when we have communion, the weeks that we have it, people come down the aisle and they take the bread and dip it in the cup, and, and a lot of people then go and kneel at the altar and pray. What I'd like to invite you to do this morning is kind of the opposite. For those of you who wish to kneel at the altar, come to the front and kneel and pray. And then when you feel that you're right before the Lord, then come and take the bread dip it in the cup, commune with the Lord, and then return to your seats. If you'd rather pray where you're seated, that's fine too. And when you feel like you're ready to come to the Lord and celebrate communion with Him, then do that. So let's pray. Father, it's the desire of everyone here, I think, to be right with you. We come to church, we come to worship, because we want to be right with you. So Lord, I pray now for every person that's here. 
including myself.